No question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Request, Dr. Molin Shah. So good afternoon, all of you. Internal rotation contracture is the most common deformity in residual obstetric palsy, and subscapularis is considered as a major culprit for producing this deformity. And so conventional treatment is addressed towards lengthening of subscapularis and transferring tendons to shoulder the uh, to balance the shoulder joint. There are different methods described in literature about subscapularis lengthening, including lateral subscapularis slide from origin, anterior subscapularis release or lengthening from insertion and recently arthroscopic anterior subscapularis release has been described. Subscapularis slide was described by Carolis and Bram in 1978. It's essentially an open procedure from the lateral border of scapula. And the original series of high rates of recurrence of uh, contract in 50 to 70 percent when they were done in isolation. But recent series suggest that recurrence rate is fairly low when it is done with the tendon transfer. The Chen et al. described the uh, the concern that the ischemic contracture of subscapularis happens due to a proximity of the neurovascular bund along the lateral border where we do the slide. So that was a concern. Anterior release includes partial lengthening or Z-plasty with or without capsule ligamentous release. But if you do excess release, they have reported external rotation contracture and anterior shoulder instability in few of those cases. And some of those patients require secondary internal rotation osteotomy. Arthroscopic release obviates formal open release, but it needs an arthroscopic setup and a good learning curve. Many of those patients are reported to have lack of midline function and axillary nerve damage is the serious complication reported in this series. So need of time is to find out something less invasive, which has minimal learning curve, which avoids excess lengthening of subscapularis, and that's how it does not weaken the internal rotation at shoulder. Since 2013, we have been doing minimally invasive subscapularis release from the medial border of scapula. And the purpose of this study was to find out whether minimally invasive subscapular release with tendon transfer produces equal results as in the other methods published in literature. To study this, we have done 30 patients uh, so far, and we included 20 patients with minimum two-year follow-up and termed them as group A with average age of five and a half years and four patients as recurrence of internal rotation contracture after Botox injections. Surgical technique involves a lateral position assessing the contracture, turning the arm internally in forward flexion to make the medial border of scapula prominent. Incision is placed at the junction of upper one-third and lower two-third. The subcutaneous tissue is widened with the help of an artery forceps, and a small periosteal elevator is introduced through the rhomboids on the undersurface of scapula and subscapularis is released in clockwise fashion, and that is followed by a bigger periosteal elevator to release the peripheral harder septas of subscapularis. And once this is done, the anterior soft tissue is gently stretched over five minutes, and the wound is closed in by one suture, and this procedure takes only seven minutes. So as you can see, and you achieve passive external rotation in most of the cases. This is followed by a, a conventional uh, axillary approach for the conjoint tendon transfer. Single day hospitalization, uh, shoulder spica is applied for five weeks, and regular physiotherapy for one year post-op. Outcome measures we use is active and passive external rotation range. The global shoulder function was measured with aggregate MALI score, and we got axial MRI imaging of glenohumeral joint before and after the surgery. The control group involved 21 patients who had underwent similar, uh, who had similar clinical finding and underwent anterior subscapular release with or without capsular lig ligamentous release with conjoint transfer we did in 2011 to 13. All these patients were comparable in terms of number, their clinical preoperative examination, and their aggregate MALI score. 15 of our patients uh, had congruent glenohumeral joint that was matching with water schema 1, 2, and 3, while five patients in each group have waters 4 or non-congruent glenohumeral joint. In results, we found that uh, the preoperative passive external rotation improved from plus 10 degrees to plus 80 degrees at three months follow-up, and it, re it improved further to 88 degrees at the uh, two years final follow-up. And similarly, the active external rotation improved from minus 10 preoperatively to 40 degrees 
three months and 60 degrees at post uh, two-year final follow-up. We saw that Mali score improved from 2.16 pre-op to four at final follow-up. Aggregate Mali score improved to 18 and all the MRI parameters also improved uh, substantially from our group. This is an adolescent patient who had marked trumpeting and internal rotation contracture treated with MISR and tendon transfer, and her abduction and trumpeting resolved, abduction improved, and this, she has a very minimal scar, aesthetic scar, as you can see. When we compared our outcome measures with the group B and a published series of uh, pearl et al. in JBJS 2006, which our group of patients were comparatively matchable, we found that there is no difference in the outcomes of all the three series. There is no statistically significant difference, but when you see MRI, we found that the patients who were treated with uh, arthroscopy or open release, they had some better glenohumeral centralization, but those patients also required a few of internal rotation osteotomy secondarily. When we looked closely at our non-congruous glenohumeral joint, we found that three of five patients had persistent internal rotation position of arm, and they did not show improved water schema. There's no apparent adverse event. One patient developed swelling along midline, medial scapular border, which resolved spontaneously. So in discuss, discussion, I've, we find that the MISR corrects internal rotation contracture in congruent glenohumeral joints satisfactorily. Passive external rotation improved by 80 degrees at three months did not reduce at two years follow-up, so there is no recurrence of contracture. And follow-up MRI shows improvement in glenohumeral joint and remodeling, at least in congruent glenohumeral joints. Clinical outcome are same when compared with the anterior soft tissue and arthroscopic series, but none of the patient in MISR group developed over lengthening of subscapularis or external rotation contracture. Persistent internal rotation of arm and inadequate improvement in glenohumeral morphology for non-congruent glenohumeral joints suggests that MISR is not adequate to relieve internal rotation contracture in these patients, and we have to address capsular ligamentous structures separately. So in discussion, MISR is a novel technique, and to our knowledge, it has not been described in literature so far. It has distinct advantages over current methods of congruent glenohumeral joint, like it's minimally invasive, there is no adverse events, at a short operative time, it is minimal learning curve. It maintains the muscle tendon unit ratio and doesn't weaken those muscles, and it avoids weakening or over lengthening of muscles. So we conclude that minimally invasive subscapular release with tendon transfer offers successful shoulder rebalancing in patients with congruent glenohumeral joint. Thank you very much. Congratulations, very impressive, new Thank technique. Um, so I have two questions. One is anytime there's a new technique, you know, and you want people to sort of uh, start practicing it, you have to tell them what are the safety issues, what are the pitfalls, yeah. what are the structures at risk. So yeah. have you done any work on that? Yeah, so we have done uh, testing of rhomboid strength post-operatively, and typically it is used, you have to pick up the, uh, the pocket and prone line. So we could test it in some older kids and not in the younger kids, they don't follow, but we did not find any weakness of rhomboids. Secondly, as I mentioned one of the slides, the subscapular neurovascular bundle lies on the lateral border of scapula, and as we remain underneath the periosteum, so we, there is less chance that we, you pierce through the periosteum, go into the muscle and injure that, but we, one has to be careful along the most lateral border of scapula while you do this procedure. And sort of my second question is, you know, you've shown a case series, but would be probably stronger science if you compare it with what you were doing before. I'm sure you're doing a different technique before. If you compare the malaise scores, et cetera. Yeah, so that's all what I have compared. In between 2011 and 13, I used to do all anterior soft tissue release mm -hmm. and then tendon transfer. But since 2013, I've changed my practice to minimally invasive subscapular release. So I compared two data. I have not been doing arthroscopy, so I uh, compared with the published uh, series of uh, Scott Cousin and Pearl, and their cases, age, and clinical parameter matching our patients. So, so I compared so with So what them. did you find? Was this technique better or yes. less blood loss? Uh, the clinical outcomes are same. And few patients of uh, anterior release, they've developed external rotation contracture. So I would suggest that 
the, this method is better because it does not produce over lengthening. And this is just a seven minutes procedure. So it is better. And anterior release there, you have to retract deltoid. So it's I a bit complex I procedure. We request, we request both of you, please uh, be short. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so as it produces comparable results, we have to go for a minimally invasive, a smaller procedure. Uh, yes. Great paper, Molin. Uh, the Thank only you. question is that uh, since you are releasing from the uh, medial border of scapula, so you will release the serratus anterior along with uh, no. scapularis. So how do you differentiate or you know that what exactly the muscle was released? So as I go underneath the periosteum, I release the origin of subscapularis and we do not touch serratus anterior. So we just release the subscap from its origin. So that's what is working. You have not mentioned the uh, you have not mentioned the tendon transfers. Which tendons you are transferring? So we did uh, conjoint led dorsi and teres major tendons transfer through axillary approach to the uh, infraspinatus and posterior superior capsule, which is done in all other studies as well. No, but do you attribute only subscapularis to be an internal rotation deform causing the internal deformity, or any other muscle? I mean, how are you sure that it was only subscapularis which was causing yes. the deformity? So there are papers now showing subscapular is a major culprit, and so but and, we find even pectoralis and the major. pectoralis major. Pectoralis major is also and so it produces more co-contraction, while subscapularis produces internal rotation contraction. But so you'll be we leaving the pectoralis major untouched almost. Yeah. So we major culprit has been found to be subscapularis in many series. Yes, sir. I think. Thank, thank, thank you. Yeah, Time is over. Thank you so much. Thank sorry, you. Sir, sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. Thank you. We can discuss. Yeah.